We have here today uh, Professor Robert Harrison from Stanford University, who has kindly agreed to share with us his memories and his thoughts on Professor René Girard. So thank you, Professor Harrison. And let me start off by asking you, when did you first hear about Professor René Girard? Was it before he came to Stanford or was it uh, when he came to Stanford? It's before I came to Stanford at our alma mater at Cornell University as a graduate student in, um, I don't remember if it was in a seminar, but I think it was more in terms of um, hearing my professors at these dinners when they would start gossiping about colleagues as professors <laughs> are wont to do. And uh, the topic of René Girard came up um, not frequently, but not infrequently either, because this was the heyday of deconstruction. Oh yes, I remember that. And as you know from your time at Cornell, Romance Studies was one of the bastions of deconstructionism. Absolutely. And of course, the um, challenge that René's thought represented with respect to deconstruction is that where Derrida and the Minions whenever they saw anything that looked like identity, they would deconstruct it to show that difference was underneath it. René is, so I first heard about him as, as someone who um, intrigued me as, as taking a, a, a rather uh, contrary approach that wherever he sees difference, he looked for the common identity underlying the difference and this um, mimetic anxiety about differentiation. Right. Uh, the book that people were talking about mostly at that time was Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, in which he, um, he took this big leap from his um, earlier work into, into, into a kind of prophetic mode about the Christian charisma. And uh, I did not, I don't recall being particularly influenced by René's thought at the time, I was intrigued by it, uh, and it, it, it appealed to me, but it was only much later when I got to know him personally that I um, delved into his work in a more systematic, comprehensive way. So when you were at Cornell, uh, Diacritic put out an issue on him. Uh, yes. Were you there when that happened? Yes, and in fact, um, I, I now that you mention it, that was one of the... Um, uh, nodal points around which a lot of this discussion concerning Hone was uh, uh, located. So, yeah, right. definitely the diacritics issue. Okay. So then when did you meet him first? I met him when I became a professor at Stanford, uh, my beginning assistant professorship in, in the 80s, mid-80s, when I arrived at Stanford. And I let me backtrack, actually, because in addition to those conversations I was referring to, John Frichero, the Dante scholar, yes, came to Cornell to teach uh, a seminar on Dante, which I followed as a graduate student. John Frichero had recently been very instrumental in getting René Girard hired at Stanford University. Correct. So my first job out of graduate school was in the Department of Italian at Stanford, and I was hired by John Frichero, and I became René Girard's colleague at the time. And we immediately became friends, also through the connection with Michel Serre, who uh, was brought to Stanford uh, by René Girard for a permanent visiting kind of uh, appointment, where he would come for one quarter a year every year. And there was a group of us that were francophone and very, uh, and, and there was a lot of camaraderie. I'm referring now not only to René Girard, Michel Serre, but Brigitte Cazelle, the medievalist oh, yeah. Brigitte Cazelle, now deceased, Pierre saint Amand, and myself. And this was a kind of uh, coterie of, uh, 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 of people in, in the Department of French and Italian that um, got together a lot and that there was a great, um, attunement between us and um, I got to know René not from a distance as you know the great theorist as much as I got to know him uh, up close 
also as a, as a person and a human being. How was he? I mean, big stars are big stars after all. So when I met him, I was, I was not quite sure who I was going to meet. I mean, I had met all these big stars like Jacques Derrida, and he was such a big star and everything. So I was not quite sure who I was going to walk into his office when I first made an appointment to go see him. And I was kind of hesitant, such a big star. So what, what, was, what was your first encounter when you met him? Such a big star. He was well, a big I, star when you met him, didn't he? Wasn't he? Well, sure. We're talking about the mid '80s. He was. He was a very big star, and he. We also had two important colloquia uh, that took place at Stanford after I arrived. Right. Uh, on his work, multidisciplinary. Right. So I am going. I am going to guess that when you met him, not knowing what to expect, you found a a, a great intellectual and renowned person who was uh, very, mo not modest is the wrong word, but who was very relaxed without pretension and without- Absolutely, without you got it. You yeah. hit it right on the nail. Absolutely, Robert. That's, uh, that's René, that was also Michel Serre. Both of them uh, were completely devoid of, of uh, the grandstanding. Uh, the opposite of Jacques Derrida, who you know, never took a mask off right. his face that, that I was aware of. Um, yeah, so, so there was, uh, we had a lot of, um, fun together and Hune was a smoking at that time, a casual smoker. I was more than a casual smoker <laughs> and, he would all, he, and I would be providing him <laughs> cigarettes. So we said, and in those days you could smoke in your office and, uh, in, in the buildings. So we would, um, in his office, usually, Don uh, Juan Cigarette, and then uh, we would uh, smoke, and others would come in there. And so the conversation was ongoing with Rene. This was on the quad at that point, or were you guys in the trailer in the 80s? No, this is before the earthquake. So we're talking about the quad in before building quad. 60 on the second floor. Great. Yeah. Okay. And, and of course, uh, Bob Cohen was part of the department at that time. Right. And if you have any recollection, Bob Cohen was so jealous <laughs> and resentful of Hone's stature and the fact that he, Hone, had a private secretary, right. Margaret Tompkins, that um, he, he just engaged in this constant sort of guerrilla warfare against Hone. <laughs> And Rene would, would, would kind of laugh it off. And he, you know, the last person to fall into any kind of, uh, you know, rivalry of that sort with, with, was Rene. So he, uh, uh, we had a lot of fun uh, uh, reading Bob Cohen's letters to the Stanford Daily and, uh, and his, the fits that he would have in the office. I'm more famous than that son of a bitch. I don't know. Yeah, I, he, he was a big Malad Bay scholar, no? Uh, so um, now you're making me remember these uh, when when being an academic was a lot of fun. <laughs> Plunged into a permanent clinical depression since then, you know, in academia. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but when I came into the I, I came to the French department from the theater department, yeah. and my first advisor was Jean Pierre Jean Jean Marie Apostolides. Jean Marie Apostolides. And, yeah. Apostolides was another one who envied Girard quite a bit. Yes. And he was always telling me, watch out for Girard, watch out for Girard. You know, he's a papiste, he's a papiste. So he, was, he had this uh, paranoia about uh, the Catholic Church and Girard. So, uh, are, you, are you interviewing uh, Jean-Marie for this show? No. No, okay. It's, 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 it's best. Jean-Marie arrived a little bit later than I did, I think two or three years later. And he quickly became the chairman of the department for some reason. Right, right. And his primary objective was to de-Girardianize the department, as he put it. Right. He, he didn't want it to be a, a, a department founded on. It, it was the biggest mistake that not only Jean-Marie made, but the whole department made, which was this paranoid, you know, anti-clerical, uh, per-blind reaction against 
you know, the major uh, uh, thinker right. and intellectual of, of the department. Right. And um, these kinds of petty rivalries that were exemplified by people like Jean-Marie and uh, Bob Cohen and stuff, they, they did nothing but exemplify in vivid terms uh, a lot of the theories that, uh, of human mimetic desire that Cornet is famous for. Right. Absolutely. And I heard a lot that uh, Jean-Marie was trying to forbid graduate students who wanted to come to the department to work with Girard. And Jean-Marie, sure. being the chair, stood in front of it to rebuke all those graduate students, I heard. So I... The damage, look, I have to say that uh, it's, you know, it's one thing to laugh off, you know, the, uh, the psychic quirks of people like Jean-Marie. But I'm not, uh, on the other hand, there, there was real damage done, I think, to the department as well as to Rene's foundational, institutional basis of uh, right. mimetic theory by a chairman who uh, would have this neurologic reaction uh, when it came to Sherard. And, and his, uh, his heir in that respect is our colleague, Joshua Landy, who, you know, if you mention Rene Girard, it's like, uh, he, he needs an exorcism because he, you know, he, he goes into a conniption when, uh, whenever the name René Girard is mentioned. Uh, and it's unfortunate because, um, as you know, René was not in any, by any measure, confrontational, nor hostile, nor mean, nor malicious of any sort. And yet he provoked a lot of uh, rather resentments. Yeah, resentments and, and even malice, downright malice. Yeah. Well, he amazingly dealt with it very well. He really dealt with it in a very Christ-like manner. He did. He did. I'm not sure myself whether his detractors were more detrimental to his, um, you know, his project than his devoted disciples. Because I think the uh, many Girardians, you know, all of whom I, I'm friends with, most of whom I know well, and certainly, but there, there's a way in which, as Nietzsche has an aphorism somewhere that uh, every party has certain people whose excessive zeal provokes all the others to apostasy. Mm -hmm. So there is a certain kind of excessive zeal among some of the Girardians that um, make one want to recoil from being identified as a, Girard, as a kind of pure Girardian. But that is another um, part of René's uh, institutional uh, context that makes, uh, you know, complicates things also a little bit. Well, ultimately, I hope it balances things off, you know, because uh, you have Girardians all over the world. We have Girardians in Italy, as you well know, Yes. Of people like uh, Pier Paolo Antonello, who I just interviewed for the film. And uh, you have people in Austria, you have people in Germany, you have it all over the world. So it doesn't have to be only America or France. Oh, absolutely. And uh, Pier Paolo, I know well, he was my student. He okay. Dissertation, dissertation with me, and he's, you know, you know, one of the top Girardians and one of the. Uh, one of the real good Girardians. Girardians. I, I, I love the book he wrote with Pierre uh, Cesar, uh, uh, con, con, Conversion and con, uh, what is conversion. it called? Conversion, conversion. And Evolution oh. and Conversion. Yes, Evolution and conversion. conversion. I think that's one of the best books that came out. I, I agree with you. I really agree with you. And I have to say that I think that um, the, the, the passing away of René has done uh, has done a lot and is starting to do a, a lot to, to um, uh, make Rene's legacy and thought and corpus, um, it, it's, it's disburdened the corpus from all of the peripheral uh, personal jealousies and resentments of his colleagues and ex-colleagues and so forth. And, and, and the fact that you don't have a living person to uh, you know, attack and to, mock or whatever. It, 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 I, I think now that there's a much more sober reassessment of what is the enormous value. He was, he was much beloved and uh, that is finally the, 
much more important than even you know the, the the thought and contributions he made on the intellectual level. The fact that he was a genuine and generous uh, human being that inspired a great deal of love, which is not just devotion. There are a lot of bastards who have uh, devoted disciples. Absolutely. De devotion is not the, 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 the best measure. Love is the best measure and affection. And uh, everyone who knew René, even those who are allergic to his theory, <laughs> have a certain kind of uh, affection and love for him. Even my colleague, Josh Landy, who uh, has a lot of trouble with Girard's theories, uh, still was very fond of him, came to the funeral and so forth. So the other associations, I had more institutional associations with him as well. Often, well, let me mention that I chaired the Department of French and Italian for over seven years. And during that period, I, there were at two or three major events that I sponsored. One was a retirement colloquium for René, where I got funds from the administration, kind of uh, generous, funds to have an international conference and bring people from around the world. And we had a very high powered group of scholars uh, that came and, and uh, gave, uh, gave talks at which Rene would get up and, and um, respond to and engage each one in real time. And uh, it was a magnificent two or three day uh, retirement conference that, that was, um, full of the spirit that you were referring to, of a, a kind of affectionate, sympathetic love for him. And then also the, when he was inducted into the, into the Académie Française, I was uh, able to uh, go over with some of our colleagues and sponsor a dinner after the ceremony for about uh, 30 people. In those days, Stanford, you know, it's a la grande, as they say in Italian, you know, those kind of things are very hard to come by these days. And then when, when um, the ceremony was over, we had a, another big uh, kind of university-wide um, ceremonies, a celebration ceremony at the Cantor Museum for his induction into the uh, Académie Française. Subsequent to that, he came often to our philosophical reading group where we would read uh, essays of his and or ask him to um, speak about a text that we were reading. I remember a magnificent one on Genesis. He came to speak about Genesis and the book of Job and, and various other things and also Shakespeare. We had a reading group on, on Shakespeare and, and uh, he came to that as well. So this is after he retired. Yes. Ah, I missed that. Yeah, after he retired, yeah. It was mm. Phenomenal with Shakespeare and the Bible. I've yeah. never seen anyone else like him. He yeah. had so much passion. When I first met him, he said, it's all in Shakespeare. Everything is in Shakespeare. But then by the end, he said, everything is in the Bible. Everything is in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> I had lunch with René maybe once a week, or let's say three times a month at least, at the faculty club for years and years on end. Right. And that was in addition to seeing him often uh, just because Michel Serre would stay at René's house when he was here. Right. And go pick up uh, Michel Serre and, and um, spend time at the Girards or have dinner there. But we had this thing where uh, at least two to three times a month, we would have lunch just one-on-one. -on -one. And they, it would go on for an hour and a half, two hours sometimes, just um, and, and talk about everything from the Joseph to the back guy to uh, 
politics uh, and America and, uh, and literature, it was, uh, you could not have a more interesting interlocutor to um, have lunch with than Rene. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The, more, the more you deal with literature and, and read it in light of what one's exposure to the Girardian theory, the more Girard keeps coming back as, uh, as, as relevant. Robert, do you have a favorite book of his? Well, I mean, I have, I have, a, I have a feeling you do, but I want to see if, if it's the same. You know, I have to say that uh, I was asked to review, to do an article on René Girard for the New York Review of Books. Okay. Which came out uh, over a year ago. It was, I think, um, a year, year and a half ago. And I reread a number of books of his, and then I read one that I had not read, which was the last one about um, battling to the end. Yes, battling to the end about uh, Clausewitz, and I, it's I, I won't say that that's my favorite book, but I think that that book is uh, maybe because I hadn't read it before, it, it struck me as full of insight and relevance to our contemporary political uh, situations. And it made me regret the fact that he had not spent more time thinking of, or applying uh, his uh, ideas to you know, contemporary political realities the way he did in that book. Uh, he shied away from that. He, was he shied away from it and, and maybe he, he was right to shy away from it. On the other hand, you look at the Palestinian-Israeli conflict in those years, and it was there was such a Girardian element about that. No, yeah, you you say that this the madness of reciprocal violence is uh, is something that you you have to attain an awareness of being trapped in it in order to to um, free yourself from it. The Clausewitz book, Battling to the End, I, I, I found enlightening about war and modern warfare and, and how you battle to the end and the madness of the reciprocal violence uh, syndrome. I have to say the Shakespeare book appeals to me a great deal because it, um, it takes the mimetic theory and puts it in practice in a corpus like Shakespeare. And I find it much more... Um, compelling than even, you know, his first book on deceit, desire in the novel. Really? Yeah. I, thought, I thought my guess would have been that you'd like uh, deceit, desire in the novel. I'm not crazy about the deceit, desire in the novel, to tell you the truth, because I find that it's a little too, um, uh, it's a little too late, overladen with a, a theoretical apparatus or, or language, not apparatus, but uh, yeah a language of, uh, you know, a metaphysics of deficiency and, the, and, and there, there's, there's, it, it's, it's also, you know, with, with the diagrams and the, and the triangles and things like that. However, I'm not a big reader. I, I mean, I've, I've read, but I, how can I say I'm not a big fan of the 19th century novel? <laughs> it, 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 it will sound like I'm such a, <laughs> someone from the provinces. But I'm not a big fan of those long books that right. uh, he he uses as his case studies. You're right. Whether it's uh, you know Stendhal's um, Chateaux de Parme or whether it's right. uh, Proust, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not a lover of Proust, and and uh, so anyway, that that might have created a little bit of. Um, difficulty for me to, to get into it. The theory you know, obviously is there, but in, I find that in, in Shakespeare, it's so much more alive for me because I see it on stage. Sure. His, but, but he had to develop it somewhere. He had to start from it. So that's why Deceit Desire in the novel is the beginning. Yeah, it, no, it's absolutely crucial. I understand its foundational importance in, right. for everything that comes afterwards. Right. But if you ask me which one I would I reread with pleasure, it's uh, the Shakespeare book. Shakespeare, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. the, Shakespeare the, the theater of envy, yes. Of envy, the, right. The theater of envy. What he has to say about Hamlet, you have all these Shakespeareans that, that play has been endlessly commented on, and 
the way he just shows very uh, is so straightforwardly that Hamlet overcomes his psychological paralysis only when he sees, you know, his rival acting and inacting and dramatizing, and and, and then he just starts imitating him. And, and uh, anyway, All right, good. Uh, do you have any memories of, of uh, Martha Girard and the Girard family? Did you spend any time with them throughout all these years at Stanford? Yes, I spent a lot of time with Martha and, and Rene. And Martha, subsequent to uh, Rene passing away, uh, because I also, um, in a certain sense, have been the caretaker of his institutional memory at Stanford, even after I was no longer chairing the department. And I have been a champion of Cynthia Haven, for example, who wrote the biography of yeah. the, the Evolution of Desire. Desire. Yeah. And she is also very close with Martha Girard. And, and we, I also sponsored a, uh, a, a book uh, event for that purpose in which we talked about Rene and his work and biography and Martha was always a part of that. Um, wonderful, wonderful, mm -hmm. excellent, yeah. So do you still, uh, are you still working with the Italian Girardians? I saw you had at the Calasso uh, on one of your interviews. You brought Calasso in to talk brought, at Girard. Brought Calasso to, to Stanford yeah. to, give, to give a talk, yes. Yeah. Uh, and I also got to know Calasso. I went to see him in Milan in order to organize a, um, a conversation between Roberto Calasso and, and René Girard at Stanford that uh, almost came to fruition, but somehow there were some logistical difficulties that um, made it not happen, but I had been, yeah, uh, that would have been a, a great conversation to have had and, and, and converse. So yeah, there's Roberto Calasso, there's you know, Pier Paolo Antonello, yeah. and then there are other Italian Girardians. Uh, Giuseppe Fornari, do you know him? Yes, I know Fornari, I, and I know Fabrizio Falconi, another Girardian. Uh, and also my colleague, Laura Whitman, who is an Italianist, as well as French scholar, she does French and Italian professor. Where French at? Hmm? Where at? Here at Stanford. Okay. She is, uh, she's not a, an Orthodox Girardienne, but she is, Girard is very important for, uh, okay. for, for some of her work. And uh, yeah, so the Girard is alive and well in Italy. Very much so. That's what I hear. That's what I hear. So I'm exploring that route. So I'm, I would like to explore the Italians. I really would like to. And not only that, I have to tell you, Aki, that when I do, when I teach Dante, which I do always with pleasure and, and as often as I can, uh, Girard is always uh, someone I bring up because he is the single most useful critic whose theory applies most pertinently to the Divine Comedy, at, at, at least to hell. <laughs> and this is something that, uh, this is something that Michel Serre would also say about René, is that, you know, no one understands Le Mal, you know, better than, better than René does. But Michel wanted to, to um, you know, be the thinker of uh, Le Paradis, and, you know, and, and Le Bien, but, it's impossible to read the Inferno and know Rene's work in depth and not see Girardianism working itself out constantly in, uh, in the Inferno. And I'm sure that that's what so in, in, uh, enthralled John Frochero in the thought of uh, Rene Girard. They were friends from before, and Hopkins and so forth. Hopkins, yeah. John Frochero is the one who brought him to Stanford. Right. 
and was one of the great uh, early champions of, of his um, theories, I think, because he saw that what Rene was saying was uh, at work at every turn in, in Dante's Inferno. Tell me something. In Inferno, is there more than the triangular desire that he talks about between Beatrice and uh, his lover? I mean, do we have scapegoating in the Inferno? I don't remember. Well, I think that what you have in the Inferno is uh, it's mostly the mimetic uh, theory, but it's not so much the mimetic desire of, of romantic love, le mensonge romanesque that you have in Paolo and Francesca and Canto Five. I mean, you can't teach that Canto Five of the Inferno and, and not, you know, tell your students all about René Girard. And they all get fascinated, by the way. When they, but it's when you get into the deeper uh, recesses of hell, at the very bottom of hell, where you have the, the, these enemies and the way that they are reciprocally um, taking revenge upon themselves, and that are locked in these cycles of not only reciprocal violence, but a constant escalation of the violence and, and the logic of revenge. The uh, lower depths of the Dante's Inferno are, it is a place of terrible escalation of uh, reciprocal violence, and, and it, um, it, it's very intense and very satanic in the way that René understood the satanic. So, yeah, so it's, it's much more than just the mimetic triangle. Right. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I never thought about that because the only thing I had heard about was the mimetic triangle of Beatrice and the lover. Uh, but, uh, uh, Paolo and Francesca, yeah. Uh, Paolo and Francesca, right. Uh, Paolo and Francesca, that, that's the only thing I had known about that. But you, you're right, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I was teaching at, at Colombia, uh, the Inferno, as part of their great course. Uh, yes. Now that you're mentioning it, you're absolutely right. When you get to the lower level, it's total reciprocation of violence. Absolutely. When you have Ugolino, who is trapped in the same hole as his arch enemy, yeah. who was Ruggeri, the Archbishop of Ruggeri, and he's gnawing at his head in this kind of endless hatred. <laughs> and he says, and Dante said, tell me why you are uh, in this gesture with, with, with such a bestial sign as Dante said. And, and he says, uh, yeah, I, I will tell you and I'll tell you why I am such a neighbor to him. The word uh, neighbor, the, ta, perché io son tal vicino, this idea that, that neighborly love that turns into, a, 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 from communion you go to cannibalism, through a logic of, of, a, of, of this kind of recipro identity in reciprocity and violence. This is something that you need René to help you, you know, articulate the logic of this completely demonic logic of it. And um, that's why the students who take my Dante courses all go away with a pretty solid understanding of the foundations of René's theories. Phenomenal. I wish I had taken your course, Robert. I wish I had taken your course. I missed your course. I need to come back and take your course on Dante. <laughs> that would be yes, but you know, at the time that you were here, I might not have been emphasizing those aspects of the uh, of the poem because I was more interested in in maybe the philosophical and and the literary and and, and the psychological. I the politics of the poem have become much more compelling to me in the last decade than, than before. And that's where the tribal ethnic violence and, and kind of family feuds and, and yeah. so forth. There are a lot of parts that I would skip over that now I think are, are the most important parts. And that's where the, the Girardianism is most intense. Are you working on anything Girardian in your books or any, do you have any Girardian project on your hand? You know, I don't have, however much, you know, I. I am sold on Girard's theories and so forth. I have not, I, I don't have, he doesn't enter into my work very often. And it's only because I'm, um, 
Is it out of respect that you were kind of keeping him at, at a at a? No, no, uh, no, not really. It, it's it's because um, you know my center of gravity as a intellectual is uh, has been uh, the natural world or the relationship between culture and nature, and where uh, the intersection of the two and and. Uh, René ha, was singularly uninterested in the natural world, to tell you the truth. That's not a limitation, it's just that the social world. Yeah, the Darwin. Hmm? Darwin. Darwin. Yes, exactly. Apology and classics and, yeah, I understand. Yeah. He was interested in maybe the ethological foundation, like the, the mimetic behavior among chimpanzees and things of that sort, but it was always a social world. Social world, right. Not the natural world, and, uh, and not even very much the political world. He was interested in the political world more for what it said about the social relations. You know? yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one of the great, um, I'm not going to call it tragedies, but one of, one of, one of the things that we'll... It's, it's, it's really a shame is that René was not around to um, give us insight into this huge explosion of social media. Because if there's one thing that um, vindicates and verifies so much of his insights, it's the mimetic uh, contagion of social media and Facebook and so forth. He was around for Facebook, wasn't he? He was around for Facebook. He, it, he, he didn't it use it. Early a lot. It was early enough that he, he 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 was not able to see the extent to which extension explosion of it. Yeah, I think Facebook was founded in two thousand and five. Right. So, and he was already out of touch with yeah. contemporary culture by that point, and people around like me. It's like, I, it took a while for even the rest of us to uh, realize yeah. that like, this complete silliness was going to take over uh, the, the whole world. Yeah. Good. All right, Professor Harrison, it was very kind of you to take your time and uh, participate in this uh, tribute film. I greatly appreciate it, and I hope to see you soon. Very good to talk to you and see you after all this time, uh, Buck. Indeed, it was. It's good to know you from Cornell, and it was good to see you at uh, René Girard's uh, funeral mass in like, 2015, and here we are. Yeah, and you stay well. You too as well, and I will hopefully see you soon. Okay, well, take care. Okay.